our panelists and wanted to just give a little bit of background in regards to Consortium of Cities. Um, a couple things about what we're doing right now for 2021 um, as the new lead for, for this year, starting in January, our first meeting was the, the first week of February. And so what we did is change the format a little bit, just really to focus on working cohorts and working together. And so in 2021, members have agreed to share how their own jurisdictions are addressing or have addressed the meeting topic priority that we all chose together. And so we are, when we meet every other month, doing five to seven minute presentations, either with our town council members or with staff uh, from each one of those organizations as well, and followed by group discussion, really exploring what we can learn from each other, how we can work together throughout Boulder County and what opportunities exist to collaborate across jurisdictions to make progress on the priority areas. And so in February, we heard from Sally Anderson, Congressman Nagusa's Deputy Chief of Staff District uh, Director to give us some insight about what, what, the, what was coming along in the session and what was it planned for. In April, we, and in February, excuse me, we also then worked with our, the group that was on from leads from each one of those municipalities and talked about what those priority focus areas were and then chose those topics for this year. In April, we talked about natural disasters and resiliency again with presentations from around the area. In June, we talked about affordable and attainable housing and really got some insight about where we can be supportive of each other along the, the Boulder County corridor. And we also have every year the Consortium of City hosts Boulder County Regional Transportation Sales Tax Annual Report. And so we had that group meet with us as well and give that update uh, in June. And then later on this year, some of the other topics that we've agreed to and, and discussed together that would be really helpful for each one of our communities is to talk about economic vitality, which we'll do on August 4th, and economic sustainability. In October, we'll discuss sustainability initiatives. And then in December, we'll talk about equity in general amongst the communities. And so the exciting part about all of that is really looking at how our communities define the priority area because we know it's different depending on where we are throughout Boulder County, what work in our communities are, is being done to address the priority area and what metrics communities are using, again, so that we can be collaborative and that we can work together. I want to do a little bit of introduction uh, and, and go over the agenda for folks who might be watching later who won't be reading through the chat. We meet on when the uh, first Wednesday of every, uh, every other month from 6.30 to 8.30 uh, p.m. And tonight we have a group of folks that are going to be presenting on the, the opportunities in local communities based on Senate Bill 256 to look at local gun regulation. And so we have a few different presenters. We've had a change of schedule through the day. One of our um, subject matter experts was not, be, was not able to, to join us. Um, we are still virtual and we'll be in person um, hopefully later on this fall with a lot of other organizations. So I do wanna give a special thank you to Boulder County staff who's helping us um, one, navigate the, the virtual um, world here, and then also to one of our policy analysts, Mark Resin, who supports from a staff perspective this particular group, Consortium of Cities, and we can't make all of these pieces happen without uh, supportive staff here at the county. So I want to give folks a, that are panelists who are members of the consortium who are on an opportunity to do a, a brief introduction of your name and your title and your agency, just so we, one, so we know who's here and also for folks who are looking to find out who their rep is in their area, that would be a great opportunity. So I am going to try my best on the screen to call names out so that you'll have an opportunity again just to state your name and and your title and which um, jurisdiction min municipality that you're um, that you're with and then we will go into our presentations we always the consortium of cities we always take a break in in the middle of our work so that we can shift positions or grab something to eat for dinner etc as life continues in the virtual world so you will be able to expect a, a little bit of a break we do have um, some of our uh, registry, uh, 
our legislators here with us this evening um, as well. So again, this is a conversation that was brought to us by community just to find out how can we address and respond to state legislation that has occurred. So the same way that we're responding to other legislation, for example, the transportation bill 260, what does that mean for our local communities and folks are, are asking what, you know, what does that mean for us? How do we imp implement that? Um, and some of the other legislation that's coming across. So let's do our introductions and Polly, I've got Polly there. And then Tim, if you all wanna start. Do you, Marta, do you want me to start? I'm sorry. I thought you had said Polly. Yeah, I did. I think she just got unmuted. Yeah, I did. Um, what is it that you want? Oh, it, the same way we do at all of our consortium of cities uh, meetings, just to say your name. And oh, your okay. Name. Okay. <laughs> Good. I thought you wanted me to give a speech. Um, <laughs> Polly Christensen, Longmont City Council. Thanks. Hello, Tim Howard, um, Superior Board of Trustees. Great. Andrew and then Kyle. Oh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Andrew Perwoski. I'm the Deputy Director of State Policy at Every Town for Gun Safety. Um, uh, I help uh, provide strategic policy advice to stakeholders across the country on effective measures to prevent gun violence. Um, and really excited to join you all this evening. Thank you. Hi folks, I'm Kyle Brown, council member here in Louisville. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Allison and then Lexi. Hi, I'm Allison Anderman. I'm senior counsel at Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. And I have been working on gun violence prevention efforts with um, cities, towns, counties, and communities around the United States for over seven years. Hi, I'm Lexi Nolan. I'm the deputy director of Boulder County Public Health. Thank you both. Holly and then Hannah. Hi, I'm Holly Rogan from Lions Board of Trustees. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Shearer. I'm litigation director at Giffords Law Center to prevent gun violence. Thank you both. Brian and then Rachel. Brian Wong, Lafayette City Council. Hey, I'm Rachel Friend, uh, City of Boulder City Council. Thank you both. Mike and then Matt. Hi everyone, uh, Mike Mead. I'm the Director of Local Government Affairs at Every Town for Gun Safety. And like Allison, working with uh, cities, counties, school boards all across the country. Thanks so much. Marty, did you refer to me? Because there, there are a lot of Matts and a lot of Joneses out there in this world. Um, so on Matt, my screen, there's only one Matt right now. Okay, all right. Matt Jones, Boulder County Commissioner, and I live, live in Louisville. Thank you. Claire and then Mark. I can't tell if I'm unmuted. I guess I am. Uh, Claire Levy, County Commissioner and colleague of Matt Jones and Marta Lochimi. And good evening, everyone. Mark Rosen in the Boulder County Commissioner's Office staff. Appreciate all of you joining us this evening and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks again for all your help, Mark, on the coordination. Let's see here. I've got Barb and then Chris. Hi, everybody. Barb Halpin. I'm really just co-hosting tonight, but thank you. I work with the County Commissioners as the Public Information Officer. Hi, I'm Chris Lay. I'm a, a Louisville City uh, Councilman uh, sitting in tonight to hear. Great, thank you. And I wanna, we'll have a little time to hear from our legislator, legislators here in a bit, but I would like to 
um, thank and welcome both Judy Amavale and Edie Houghton. If you'd like to do your quick intros. Judy, Hi, there. I'm, yeah, I'm Judy Amavale and I represent House District 13, which is the western part of Boulder, the city of Boulder, western Boulder County, uh, Gilpin, Clear Creek, Grand, and Jackson counties. Hi, and I'm Edie Hooten. Uh, I represent House District 10, which is uh, center Boulder uh, going east to Gun Barrel. And I am the House sponsor of Senate Bill 256, which we are discussing this evening. Great. Thank you all. And I'll try and um, watch the participant list in case there's other folks that join us in on the panelist side while we're while we're talking to give them an opportunity to introduce, which is just how we typically do our consortium meetings. So thanks again, everybody, for, for participating. So we're going to um, jump right in here with our presentations. And we'll start with the collaborative action with Rachel Friend and Tim Howard. Thanks, Marta. Um, and it is uh, really a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight um, for Tim and I who've been kind of working on um, this concept for coming up with a collaborative kind of collective action that we could take in response to 1256. So excited to be here. And I think Tim's going to do most of the presenting and also just wanted to say thank you to Edie Hooten and Judy Mabale and uh, Steve Femberg, if he's here for uh, getting us here with 1256. And I, I apologize. I'm going to stop you for just a minute because I can see staff. Um, Jennifer Hill, you've got your hand up. So I want to make sure we're not having a tech issue. Just trying to get this screen share going. One second, please. Okay. While we're waiting to do that, I just want to echo um, Rachel's comments. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, and as, or more importantly, thank you to Representative Amabile, Representative Hooten, um, for moving forward uh, with a number of initiatives, not the least of which is um, SB 256, which is kind of really the focus tonight. Great, and with that, um, are we ready to go, Jennifer? Thumbs up? Okay. So, um, if you just go to the next slide, um, so, so the, the the basic concept here is that um, if we if we act potentially act together, um, we can have a greater impact. And the genesis of this activity was shortly after the uh, King King Super shooting. Um, I reached out to Rachel um, to talk about what we might do in Superior. Um, in collaboration with, with Boulder yes. City um, to, to potentially help make, our, make everyone a, just a slight bit safer. Um, and then 256 started to move forward. Um, and so what you're going to see here is kind of the work we've been pursuing for the last um, two months or so in collaboration with others. Um, and it really now became operative given the passing and the signing of Senate Bill 256. So if we, if we go to the, the next slide, just to kind of set the context. Um, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read through these. Um, but, you know, Colorado, we, we have a, we have a long history of mass shootings and, and gun violence. Um, we, we just passed a 4th of July weekend um, in our country where 233 people were killed with gun violence. I think um, close to um, 500 were um, injured. Um, and surprisingly, that number was down 26% from the year before. Um, so it is an ep epidemic, um, I think, in the state of New York over this um, past month more people died from gun violence than from COVID. Um, so we're, we're dealing with an epidemic. And the question is, can we do some things locally 
um, just as Boulder County Public Health did on the COVID side, that can make all of us um, a bit safer. Um, Rachel, do you want to chime in on, on kind of this as the kind of starting point? No, I think that's um, well said, Tim. And um, again, the, the genesis is sort of, I would say that Tim and I and others were um, kind of watching the, the state legislation move forward and thinking through how could we um, collaborate to, to take advantage of opportunities to, to try and keep our, our cities safest, uh, especially given what had happened in Boulder um, in March. So I think probably next slide. So, you know, as, as was noted, um, the state legislature did move forward a number of gun violence prevention um, legislation this year. Um, we're going to focus on 256, but um, kind of some of our partners here who are going to be speaking um, after us, um, both from Giffords and Everytown, um, also were active in, in contributing um, to, to that legislation. Um, but expanded background checks, um, establishment of a gun violence prevention office, safe storage of firearms, and a requirement to report lost or stolen weapons. All of these contribute um, to, to us being safer. Um, but what we know is there, it's not necessarily far enough. And the previous slide um, kind of highlighted that. So there's more to do. And the, the question is, what, what can we do? What can we possibly do? Um, and and that's, that's where we are today. And because of 256 being signed into into law, we have the opportunity to act. So that's what um, that's what we want to talk to you about about some ideas there. So if we go to the next slide, um, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on 256. Um, I think we're going to hear a little bit um, from Representative Amabile and, and um, sponsor Representative Hooten um, on that a bit a bit later. Um, but, uh, and we can also hear from, um, from our legal experts from Giffords and, and every town in that regard. Um, but what it does do, it sets the stage for us um, to potentially do something at a local level. And if we do it at a coordinated local level, potentially it becomes a regional um, activity. So we as local leaders have an opportunity to do more than just pass resolutions that urge the state legislature to act, we get to act um, at this point. Um, but wanting to do it and actually bringing it to fruition are two very different things. So what we wanna do is touch on how we might do it. Rachel, any, any comments on 256 before we jump in? No, I, I, I would just highlight the, the first bullet that being the first state to repeal preemption is um, is really exciting for Colorado and an opportunity for us to um, do something novel and inventive in light of that. And and as you will hear from our reps, the, the whole point of that is that cities are in a good position to, to respond to um, the type of gun violence that they experience in their cities. In a city like Boulder, um, with a higher population density and a higher number of um, people coming into to our uh, space during the work days, we know that those things statistically correlate with a higher likelihood of mass shooting. So we will likely go for something like an assault weapons ban, but that is um, reinstating it. So that is um, not something that that all of, of the cities are gonna wanna do, but it's a, it's a um, we have a really exciting opportunity to uh, be the first in the country to act in ways that benefit our cities. So with that, back to you, Tim. All right, next slide, please. So there are many challenges to enacting local gun laws. Um, and, and really at the front of it, I think what we have to acknowledge is that anything we do locally will be less impactful than it would be if it were adopted statewide. And it's even less, less so than if it would have been adopted nationwide. So what we're, not, what we're not looking for here is the perfect. 
um, what we're looking for is what can be done that has an incremental benefit um, and improves the health and, and safety for our residents. Um, we have to acknowledge that few municipalities um, or counties for that matter necessarily have the resources and expertise to identify, define and adopt a suite of local gun ordinances that will su survive the probable legal challenges and um, court interpretation. Um, getting law enforcement buy-in will be a lot of work, um, especially if there's a lot of, um, a lot of difference and um, lack of commonality um, among the neighboring jurisdictions. Um, you know, we need to accept the fact we're not gonna end mass shootings, we're not gonna end gun violence, um, but we can make things a bit better and potentially lay out um, a framework that could be followed by others. And the more that join, um, potentially the safer we can make it for folks. Um, and Rachel, you probably have a better perspective than, than most on just how hard it is to do some things even at the local level, um, given Boulder's experience back from 2018. Yeah, and um, I see that Jill Grano, who was on city council at the time is on this call. So um, I don't know if it's appropriate to invite her to chime in, but would welcome um, her perspective. But to the point of, of having the resource, resources and expertise to adopt ordinances, I will say that it was, um, I, I was involved from, from the um, other side of the dais at the time as an activist. And it was a lot of time and energy for uh, our city attorney's office and staff um, just to research what might be a, a constitutional gun law and, and how to craft it. So it is um, a huge lift if you don't have a lot of help. And then there is the aspect of just there's really strong opposition. Um, people turn out and um, there's a lot of kind of bullying and, and difficulty around just the, the, and a lot of just strong energy against um, trying to enact laws that are really about you know, freedom from, from the devastating impacts of gun violence and um, be that suicide or homicide, mass shooting. So um, it is a really big lift for cities and, and a big part of what Tim and I are trying to do today is to um, start a dialogue about how we can make that really much easier and doable for, for each individual city to adopt. Okay, next slide, please. So here are the kind of principles and, and kind of the way we look at this is how can we how can we do just what Rachel said, which is attempt to make things both a bit easier, um, but also lay the groundwork to make sure we're doing the right things and the most impactful things. Um, the first is really around the definition of collective action. If we were to act together on a set of common ordinances. We may not be able to get them enacted statewide, but we can have a larger impact and we could potentially impact a large percentage um, of the residents of Colorado. Um, in order to do this, we've got to tap into the national experts, the folks who understand not just the legislation, but the impact of that legislation and how it should be prioritized. Um, we also want to make sure that we're interacting with the district attorneys in both our jurisdictions, but also adjacent jurisdictions um, so that they can become allies. We can do things that are consistent and we have the ability to talk with law enforcement and come up with approaches that make sense and, and can be accepted and enforced um, by our various local law enforcement groups. Um, and then lastly, working with the attorney general, the attorney general's office to get their review and their insight because we wanna make sure that anything we do is, will, will withstand the scrutiny of the courts and will, um, will be upheld. So we want good ordinances, we want them to be defendable, and we wanna do it in a way um, that has the most impact for our, our community. Um, and our goal here 
is not to proscribe, prescribe what anyone should do. Rather, it's to give a model set of ordinances that can be available to the different jurisdictions. And as, as Rachel said earlier, for each jurisdiction, the set that may make sense is going to potentially vary on, on what makes sense for their community um, and is supported by their residents. Um, Rachel, any, any comment on the, the kind of the, the way we've tried to reach out to the other, um, other folks for input? Um, no, other than obviously we're still at a, a really early stage and, and um, part of what we're doing here tonight is, is sort of inviting the dialogue around how can we um, do this in a way that is most helpful and responsive to any individual community's needs. So, you know, the bottom bullet, our, our goal is, is with the help of Giffords and every town to um, just come with a, come up with a set of model ordinances that would be the same and vetted and um, you know I don't know that we can say will withstand constitutional uh, ground challenges but but have the best likelihood of, of um, surviving given the given the legal landscape so we want this to be super easy kind of plug and play what are the what are the um, ordinances that that your constituencies are interested in and here's a here's a, a really light lift for your attorney's offices and um, to be able to run with those and modify them as, as desired by your cities. So that's kind of the, the goal and the, the hope here is that we can, we can just be helpful and collaborative together here. All right, Jennifer, next slide, please. Um, and so as, as we indicated, um, we've reached out to um, the, the team at Giffords and, and every town um, to get not just their um, insights and legal advice, but also to kind of get feedback from them on this type of approach. Um, because they, as you heard during the introductions, they have experience working kind of across the country. And maybe at the um, start of their presentation, they can talk a little bit about that experience and, and what has worked and, and what hasn't worked. We've tried to integrate that um, into what we're presenting, what Rachel and I are presenting to you tonight, but it's, it's always best to hear from the experts um, directly. Um, so, so we can move on to, to the next slide. Um, and at, you know, as we mentioned, we need to engage with the law enforcement community um, so that we're all on board and all kind of working together um, towards a common goal of making everyone safer. So if we can go to the next next slide. Um, and this this really is the deliverables. Um, Rachel, do you want do you want to kind of walk through these? I can. Um, and, and it's it's um, discussing what what I was um, getting at earlier, which is that we, hope to have this, this set of thoroughly vetted um, ordinances that, that cities can kind of choose from the menu of options from. Um, and we've asked Giffords in every town to kind of group them into three tiers, or it might be that they suggested that we group them into three tiers. Um, so the first tier would be what we're calling strong group. And so those are ordinances that uh, when we combine them with our Colorado state laws, they bring us to a uh, Gifford's standard of strong. And then we have a stronger group, which is when we combine it with state laws, um, we're at the, we as cities will be at their, um, what they call stronger level gun safety laws. And then strongest group will be a set of ordinances that if adopted by a city will combine with Colorado laws to um, bring your city to the, the kind of highest level of, of gun safety protection that, that Giffords recommends. Um, and obviously, we're, we would have no power to require any municipality to adopt any set of ordinances. Um, we're just trying to lift up uh, ideas for if, if what your community is after are, are the strongest kind of gun violence prevention uh, laws that, that we've gleaned from around the country, then these are likely to be the ones that you're after. And then, you know, the next two tiers below that. Um, and then we will... Um, work on sort of communication strategies for each ordinance that we'd be discussing and, and Giffords and 
every town are, are working together on that. And then um, for those that that do want to participate in kind of a wave one of rolling out um, some gun laws, we are looking at maybe a coordinated schedule for different cities to kind of join together and participate in a coordinated rollout. Um, and that's beneficial uh, in a couple of ways that I think we will get into later. Excellent. Jennifer, next slide. Next. So we, we just kind of walked through this. Um, and again, as Rachel said, um, this, is, this is a work in progress. Um, we're looking for those who are interested to work with us. If you, if you want to roll your sleeves up on this and help work on the deliverables and, and coordinate with folks, we'd love to um, have you join us. Um, but if you'd rather wait and see what the output looks like and decide at that point in time, if it's something that makes sense to socialize with your town boards, um, that's okay too. And lastly, if you think for your town makes the most sense to just wait and see how a first wave might roll out, that's okay also. So this is, this is not a, um, a quick fix to anything. Um, what we're looking to do is set in motion a set of rational, um, well thought out things that can be adopted at a local level that can set the stage and, and give, a, um, give a pathway for other communities to follow. So that, that's our goal here. Um, as, as Rachel said, no one's required to do anything, but at the same time, the belief is if we can garner the resources into a toolkit, it can make it a lot easier and eliminate some of the um, resource barriers to actually examining this um, at a local city council or board of trustees level. Rachel, any, any other comments on this? I think we're almost ready to hand it over to our, to our partners here. No, um, I would just say that the, the partners are going to explain kind of what, what sorts of laws we would be looking at or ordinances um, cities might want to roll out because right now, you know, we're sort of theoretically talking about, you know, an action plan without giving any concrete examples. So I think that that will be helpful for um, the next phase of the conversation is sort of what, what are the options of, of what cities could do or might want to do and, and how will those get kind of packaged up for us? Yeah, and, and just to kind of add to that a little bit, um, we're intent, we intentionally don't want to roll things out, if you will, until they've been fully vetted. So the idea is first we want to explain the process, then what we want to do is let the experts um, talk a bit with you and then kind of get to work. Um, so with that, Jennifer, can you move to the next slide? Um, we've hit on we've hit on all these things um, already, um, but just to reiterate Rachel's point um, from the beginning of this, um, the passing and the signing of Senate Bill two fifty six um, is a really big deal. It's it's kind of a um, a new day, if you will. Um, state preemption hasn't been repealed before, at least that's our understanding from, um, from our partners. Um, if, we, if we have one municipality that takes this forward and adopts some additional things, that's a huge win. That's, that makes 256 um, enormously impactful. If we get multiple municipalities to do that, um, that's a potential game changer. So no matter what, you know, we want to invite everyone to, at the very least, take a serious look at this because in a lot of ways, it, it is a new day uh, because of the action of the legislature um, with 256. Um, so with, with that, Jennifer, you want to move to the next slide? Um, and now we're going to pass it over um, to the team at Giffords in Everytown. Um, maybe um, Al, maybe we start with Allison and then kind of go from there. 
Thanks very much, um, Tim and Howard. And thank you everyone for the opportunity and to speak tonight on this issue and in particular to the sponsors of SB 256 that will allow Colorado communities to take action on gun safety. So as Tim mentioned, along with my colleague, Andrew from Everytown, I'm going to give some ideas um, for local collective action. And um, before I go into specific ordinances, I wanted to um, give some examples of the power of collective action. So California is a state that affords localities wide latitude to address gun violence. And now California has joined um, California, I'm sorry, Colorado has joined California as a handful of states that allows such local regulation. Um, so in California, back in the early to mid 90s, rates of gun violence were peaking, in particular in urban areas. Um, and as a result, California communities began passing hundreds of local laws over the next 30 years. And many of those um, laws that began as these uh, collective local action efforts have become state laws. And just to give you a handful of examples, um, assault weapon and large capacity ammunition bans, laws that prohibit the sale and manufacture of unsafe handguns, known as Saturday night specials and junk guns, um, laws that require guns to be safely stored in vehicles, that re require gun dealer employees to undergo background checks, and many, many more. And, you know, partly as a result, California now has the strongest gun laws in the nation and a correspondingly um, very low gun death rate. Now, I want to also highlight one particular local effort um, known as the East Bay Corridor Project. So back in the early 90s, um, cities and a number of communities that were particularly impacted by gun violence were having issues with um, the proliferation of these cheap, dangerous um, cheaply made and inexpensive and dangerous handguns. And those were the Saturday night specials or junk guns that I referenced. Um, at the same time, there were huge numbers of gun dealers in certain communities that were particularly hard hit um, by gun violence, such as Oakland and Richmond, California. Um, Oakland is in Alameda County and Richmond is in Contra Costa County. And in those two counties at that time, there were 1,100 gun dealers. Um, and there were 115 gun dealers in Oakland alone. <laughs> so 16 communities in these two counties banded together to pass a bunch of local laws, but in particular, bans on these junk guns and also laws that would impose reasonable oversight and regulation of gun dealers operating in the communities. And this effort had really impressive results. Um, in terms of the junk gun bans, in just a few years, all of the participating localities, plus five neighboring jurisdictions and Alameda and Contra Costa County had banned junk guns. Um, and that those local bans be, became the basis for a very comprehensive statewide law in California known as the Unsafe Handgun Act. And California is now actually one of only two states that, that um, regulate unsafe handguns so comprehensively. Um, and these communities also, you know, worked collectively to enact gun dealer ordinances. Um, and as a result, it, the number of gun dealers in these communities dramatically dropped. In Oakland, the number dropped from 115 to seven, and in Richmond from 15 to two. And there are actually no gun dealers in these communities today. And actually, um, a US Department of Justice report looked at the impact of these dealer re regulations and found that um, the a ATF and local police were able to increase their monitoring of the smaller number of remaining dealers to ensure their compliance with applicable laws and regulations. So I gave that example and that history to illustrate the power of a collective movement of localities and how not only can they really move the needle on a state's gun violence prevention efforts, but when working in concert, they can have some pretty impressive results. 
So now I would like to give some examples of the types of ordinances that um, Tim and Rachel mentioned in you know, what we would consider the strongest category. And um, I'm going to start with comprehensive dealer regulations because of the example that I just gave. Um, and when I'm talking about comprehensive dealer regulation, I'm really talking about laws that give communities oversight and the power to revoke licenses of dealers who are not operating lawfully or not in compliance with laws that the community feels are necessary for um, responsible uh, operation. So, you know, normally these licenses are issued by local law enforcement in the community. Um, and, you know, just a point about um, non-compliant dealers and um, the ability of a locality to revoke a license by a non-compliant dealer. Um, while ATF does license dealers and they, they grant them federal licenses or licenses, the ATF very rarely revokes dealer licenses, even by, uh, by dealers who are found to have violated federal or state law. So giving localities this power to revoke licenses or licenses, I'm sorry, is really actually um, an important and powerful step. Um, these licensing schemes also afford law enforcement oversight of the dealers who are operating in their communities, as well as community members. Um, and localities can put a variety of conditions on licensure, so they can require that um, background uh, gun dealer employees background check their, I'm sorry, gun dealer employers background check their employees. They can require that gun dealers safely store their inventory when they're closed for business to prevent um, burglaries, in particular a type of burglary known as a smash and grab, where an assailant drives their car into the front of a gun dealership and makes out with all the inventory and that those happen all over the United States. Um, and uh, these localities can require gun dealers to actually video record transactions and um, video recording, which Walmart has been doing for many years, the largest gun retailer in the United States, allows law enforcement to solve crimes such as a straw purchase, um, a robbery and other types of uh, gun crimes. And um, finally, localities can use licensure as a way to zone dealers away from schools and other areas where the uh, presence of guns is particularly dangerous and um, other areas as well. And um, we know that gun dealer regulations are impactful, that when these laws are um, enacted at the state level, those states have significantly lower levels of gun trafficking and the exporting of crime guns um, to out of the jurisdiction. Now, moving on, localities can also regulate gun carrying. And um, so, this is important because there are a lot of negative effects associated with carrying guns in public, which I'll get into. So localities can ban open carry altogether and the carry of concealed firearms by people with permits in certain what we call sensitive locations. So just to go to the data to support these recommendations, um, the data is clear that more guns in public lead to more shootings, not fewer. There's actually really powerful research out of Stanford University that states with weak laws regarding carrying have much higher rates of violent crimes. Um, guns that are carried in public are much more likely to be stolen and used in subsequent crimes. And despite the gun lobby propaganda, carrying a gun just doesn't actually work to make you safer. Um, there is a study that shows that if you're carrying a gun when you're actually attacked, you're more likely to be shot than if you were unarmed. So we know that carrying guns in public is a public safety hazard actually, um, but in particular open carrying of firearms has additional um, risks. You know, and, and the main risk with that is intimidation of people. Um, when you are confronted with someone carrying a gun when you're trying to vote or speak at a legislative meeting or engage in free speech at a rally or a protest, 
um, you may not engage in those First Amendment protected activities and these other constitutional rights because you are afraid of uh, being shot by someone who gets really angry. And this is not a, you know, a specious um, concern. This is this has actually happened. Um, when tensions get high and there are guns in public, people have been shot at movie theaters, in parking lots. Um, but I think it's particularly insidious when these, these um, open carry situations are directed at people of color who are engaging in these activities because we know that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. So when a person of color is um, you know, lining up at their polling station and they see a person carrying a gun, um, they very well may turn around. And we obviously do not want that to happen. And because there is no really valid reason for carrying that gun, um, we think that it makes very good evidence-based sense to ban this type of open carry. Um, and also banning concealed carry in certain places where the presence of guns are particularly dangerous, such as government buildings or stadiums where tensions and emotions can run high, like I just described, bars where people are intoxicated, um, and places where people are being treated for mental illness. Um, places that have been historic targets of violence, such as houses of worship. And areas where there are high concentrations of children and teens, such as daycares, playgrounds, um, et cetera, residential uh, facilities. And I also want to mention that these carrying restrictions are also good uh, options for colleges and universities that are in jurisdictions that have not chosen to take such local action. So they can do this on their own. So now I'm going to pass it over to Andrew from Everytown to discuss some other ideas. Great, uh, thank you so much, Allison. And thank you again, everyone, for having me here this evening. Um, again, Andrew Karwaski, I'm the Deputy Director of State Policy at Everytown for Gun Safety. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, um, which you may wish to consider, um, are assault weapons prohibitions. So assault weapons, as we all know too well, um, are frequently used in mass shootings. Um, our organization actually did a study of all of the mass shootings uh, defined as incidents where four or more people were shot and killed uh, from 2009 to 2018. And what we found is that uh, assault weapons were responsible for 32% of all of the firearm deaths in those incidents and about 82% of firearm injuries. Um, so when assault weapons are used in mass shooting incidents, um, the uh, resulting deaths are, are six times that of incidents that don't involve a assault weapon. So it's very clear that assault weapons pose a, a very real public safety risk. Um, and there is the opportunity on the local level to regulate them. Um, obviously, Boulder has uh, already done this, um, but there is the opportunity in other municipalities. Um, and you just need to think carefully about how you structure the law, um, how you define assault weapons. Assault weapons, which are high-powered semi-automatic firearms are generally defined by certain features and particularly the uh, characteristics uh, or the presence of a uh, one or more military style uh, features. So uh, you have to think about how you define an assault weapon, um, how you address currently possessed assault, uh, assault weapons, and also whether, uh, there, whether exemptions um, for law enforcement uh, and military and what other exemptions you might need. Um, but that's one possibility. And we also know that assault weapons are made even more effective uh, when they are uh, paired with high capacity magazine restrictions. Uh, similar, uh, similarly to assault weapons, high capacity magazines are frequently used in mass shootings. Uh, that same study that we put together um, found that when high capacity magazines are used in a mass shooting, they result in about twice the number of deaths and 14 times the number of injuries. Um, we also found that in those incidents in that 10-year period, about 60% of mass shooting incidents involve a high-capacity magazine. Um, so regulating them, again, makes public safety sense. There's a strong amount of research that uh, regulating high-capacity magazines can prevent mass shootings and prevent gun violence generally. And, um, you know, it's something that Colorado state law actually already regulates. Um, the main issue and the opportunity on the local level is that Colorado regulates high capacity magazines as a general matter that can accept 
uh, 15 rounds of ammunition or more. Um, now, most state laws um, actually set the bar a little bit lower and regulate um, when uh, ammunition, uh, when a magazine can accept 10 rounds of ammunition or more. Um, so there's an opportunity on the local level to uh, build upon what the state law does um, and set a, a lower bar and prohibit all high capacity magazines that can accept 10 rounds of ammunition or more. Um, so those two ideas naturally go hand in hand um, and can work well together um, and help can help prevent mass shooting. Um, another idea uh, is to address the growing threat of ghost guns, which are among the biggest uh, gun violence threat this country faces. Uh, so ghost guns uh, are DIY firearms. Um, certainly they can be made by a 3D printer at home, um, but more commonly they're made from easily accessible parts that can be purchased on the internet without a background check. Um, because they can uh, be purchased without a background check uh, and because they lack a serial number, um, which makes them untraceable and makes it very difficult for law enforcement to solve gun crimes when these guns do inevitably turn up at crime scenes, um, they are becoming the favorite tool of uh, violent criminals, violent extremists, and other people who are legally prohibited from buying or having guns. Um, so municipalities uh, can take steps to regulate ghost guns. Um, Colorado has no state ghost guns law. Um, it does, they do not regulate them. Um, and unfortunately, the federal government does not either. Um, some of you may have heard, obviously, that the Biden administration has proposed a change to federal regulations to address the threat of ghost guns, um, but that is no barrier to local action. And obviously, it can take some time before the rule goes into effect. Um, so local localities can act, um, can act immediately um, to do two things. Um, they can first prohibit uh, the possession, sale, or manufacture of unserialized firearm, or uh, alternatively, and in conjunction, they can um, prohibit the uh, purchase or sale or possession of unserialized firearm parts, particularly firearm frames or receivers. And this would help address the growing threat of ghost guns um, and help them uh, help ensure that they don't proliferate in your communities. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's a serious threat to you know gun violence prevention across the country. Um, ghost gun recoveries in California are up exponentially. Um, we've seen cities like Washington, D.C. Um, and Syracuse, New York, um, really experience an influx of ghost guns. And it's really a critical uh, time to address this before you know, the situation gets worse. Um, so ghost guns uh, are another idea. And then I wanna talk about two more. Um, so the next idea I wanted to talk about is uh, setting a minimum age to purchase semi-automatic firearms. And this is actually raising the age to purchase rifles and shotguns to 21 years old. Um, if you are 18 years old currently under current law, you cannot walk into a gun store and you cannot purchase a handgun. Uh, however, you are free to walk into a gun store and purchase a rifle or purchase a shotgun, including the assault style firearms that we just spoke about. Obviously, um, given that the shows uh, that teenagers, 18 to 20 year olds, commit gun homicides at four times the rate of adults who are 21 years or older, um, this is a public safety risk. There's also some evidence, given that most school shooters are 18 or younger and have a connection to the school, that setting a minimum age to purchase firearms uh, at 21 uh, can be an effective school safety solution. And again, remember, we're talking about purchase. And obviously, the intent is not to um, prohibit uh, recreational activities or to prohibit hunting or sports shooting. You can design these uh, ordinances in a really effective way that uh, has narrowly tailored exemptions and, again, will not have an undue impact on people's right to buy or have guns. Um, and then finally, uh, we're talking about waiting periods. Um, as many of you know on this call, uh, firearm suicide across the United States is an epidemic. Uh, the rates have been skyrocketing over the last decade. Colorado, um, and stats I looked at just before this call that my organization tracks based on CDC data, has the 13th highest rate of firearm suicide in the United States. So one way for localities to address this is to pass a waiting period provision. Um, so waiting periods are a uh, cooling off period and they insert a number of days or uh, amount of time between the purchase, the attempted purchase of a firearm and when that firearm is actually transferred. And now this cooling off period can be um, incredibly critical. 
um, because firearm suicide is often an impulsive act. And inserting that amount of time can allow people to get the help they need. They can reconsider their decision. Um, and it's incredibly important when you consider that firearms are, are an incredibly lethal means of, of suicide. Um, suicide attempts with a firearm are about 90% successful. When you compare other means, other means are about 4% successful. And the vast majority of people who attempt suicide and survive do not go on to commit suicide ultimately. So um, given that lethality and given the impulsive nature of firearm suicide, um, inserting this time period into, uh, you know, the between the purchase and the transfer of a firearm can be critical and it can help save lives. Now you can uh, decide what is appropriate for your local community um, based on the number of days you want to uh, you want to consider. Um, most state laws focus on between three and fourteen days. Um, so those are the ideas uh, that I was uh, that I'm going to cover tonight. Um, and with that, I will pass it back, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Well, I am going to just check in on our schedule um, and the plan for the rest of the evening. Thank you to all the presenters that joined the Consortium of Cities this evening to talk about um, you know, what, what might we do in Colorado regarding the uh, Senate Bill 256. So just to check in on the schedule and let folks know where we are, we will have some time for question and answer. I want to um, respect our break at Consortium of Cities Group. We always take a little bit of break in case you need to change chairs or uh, finish heating up your dinner so you can eat tonight as well. Um, we'll jump back in in uh, five minutes, so it'll be 7.32. And at that time, I'm gonna give folks who've joined us since we started an opportunity as we always do to do your quick introduction. And then we are going to hear from uh, our legislators and I have a couple of questions for them after listening and participating in the conversation this evening. Uh, and then we'll go into discussion amongst local electives. So I want to um, respect that opportunity to take a quick break. Thanks again to staff for being here and we will reconvene in five minutes. Great, all right, we are still at the Consortium of Cities meeting um, on July 7th, 2021. And I wanna give an opportunity for folks who weren't here at the beginning, not to call you out, just to make sure that you're welcomed in. Um, if you didn't get a chance to just state your name and your title, which uh, jurisdiction, which town that you're with. And I know we've got some council folks that have joined us as well as some, some staff. So I will do my best to, um, let's see here, find folks on the screen. So thanks, Adam, for having your uh, camera on. So I'll, so I'll start with Adam and then Eric and then Joan and then Carl. I'm Adam Swetlick. I'm a member of Boulder City Council. Sorry, was I next there? I'm you Eric Coombs Ismail. I'm on the Netherlands Board of Trustees. Thanks, Eric. Joan, there you go. Hi, I'm Joan Peck. I'm a Longmont City Council. Uh, hello, uh, this is Carl Castillo. I'm Chief Policy Advisor, City of Boulder. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then I just saw Devin, there you are. Hi, Devin Schaff, Broomfield City Council. All right, and... I'm sure I missed somebody. So jump on um, panelists and name and uh, title. I think it was Kathleen maybe I missed. Hi, yeah, Kathleen Hogren with Every Time for Gun Safety. Great. And we had Senator Finberg on who had to jump off to another call. Um, so we won't get to hear, we won't get to hear, but that um, from, from the Senator, but we'll, that'll give our reps a, a, a few of extra minutes to, to talk with us this evening as well. So I want to, as we start back up again, just give a quick um, kind of touch base a little bit on the Consortium of City just in general. We talked at the beginning of the meeting about some of the work that we're doing right now, but I think it might be helpful for 
um, for folks who are participating to hear about some of the accomplishments and the work that the consortium has done in the past to give you some background about this particular group that's, that's led by Boulder County. In 2001 and then uh, again, 2007 to 2024, um, so has not expired yet, the countywide transportation sales tax was uh, approved by voters at both those times and implements a one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax for transportation improvements. And this was sponsored and supported by this same group, the Consortium of Cities at that time. The tax provides revenue for roadway and bikeway, bikeway improvements, intersection projects, transit projects, pedestrian access projects, and improvements to regional hiking and biking trails. And the tax will sunset, as I already mentioned, in 2024. A couple other examples of work that has started with this uh, same group, the Consortium of Cities. In 2012 to 2013, the Water Stewardship Task Force and Report uh, was initiated, initiated, initiated and worked on um, providing governmental, nonprofit, and private sector entities within Boulder County a forum for promoting water, water stewardship through collaborative initiatives which mutually benefit our communities and our watersheds. And the task force explored such issue areas as water conservation, water sources and supply, coordinated drought response, and a variety of educational campaigns. The implementation plan completed by the task force continues to inform water policy and programming across the county. Another example in 2016 was permanent supportive housing study. In February of 2016, the Consortium of Cities collaborated with the 10-year plan to end homelessness board of directors to prepare an assessment of the need for permanent supportive housing throughout Boulder County. And that focused specifically on chronically homeless individuals, um, individuals in our community who um, are experiencing homeless in a chronic fashion. This study included an assessment of the barriers and challenges to developing permanent housing solutions for these residents and identified the types of properties and projects that could be constructed in Boulder County to meet permanent supportive housing needs. And so I share those as just a few of the examples and, and uh, to just based on a couple of the points that folks um, shared in the presentation about what can happen when we do collaborative work. What can happen when we have dialogues and conversations with local elected officials who know their communities, but we're all part of the Boulder County region. And so uh, I thought that might be helpful for folks who are maybe joining in on this conversation um, for the first time. So we'll jump back to our agenda. And we are moving on to our legislators. And so I want to give, um, a couple minutes. Thank you both Rep Amable and Rep Hooten for being with us this evening. I've got a couple of questions um, that I wanna ask and then give you all a chance to, to respond together. Um, the first one we'd love to hear. Um, and it might be helpful just to have a, a quick little piece around the 256 from a specific standpoint as well. But after hearing tonight's conversation uh, and or after gathering feedback from constituents and stakeholders, what are your thoughts on the implementation of uh, Senate Bill 256 at the local level? Love to hear from both of you. Well, thank you, Marta. And I think I'll go first, um, just as the house sponsor, I do want to acknowledge and really appreciate um, my colleague, Representative Judy Amable uh, for her bill which I hope she has an opportunity to speak about. Uh, the preemption bill, uh, what it does is it restores a provision in Colorado State Constitution that has been there since 1902, uh, which acknowledges the right of Colorado communities to pass ordinances and regulations around gun legislation that reflects the values and the interests of their communities. That is what this bill does. In 20, uh, 2003, uh, the Owens administration led uh, an effort to overturn that provision in our state constitution and, and they were successful in that. And so what Senate Bill 256 does is it restores 
uh, a provision in Colorado State Constitution that's been there since 1902. And that is acknowledging that every community has their own um, ideas about what makes them feel safe. And they could be vastly different. We come from a very large state. We've got a large rural population. We've got urban areas uh, that have, you know, very different opinions about safety and um, and how they would like to see their laws, their ordinances um, reflect their communities. So what this bill does is once again restore the opportunity for robust conversation at the local level around uh, gun prevention violence ordinances. That's, that's what it does. It does not require anything more than that. And I think if anything reflects the spirit of Colorado, it's um, the opportunity to give local communities voice and choice on matters that affect their communities quite deeply and very personally. And so that's why I was very proud to be on this bill uh, with Senator Fenberg and um, everything else that was discussed tonight uh, about gun violence, I feel very, care very deeply about as a policymaker and just as a mother, as a person in the United States, seeing the statistics. But if we're speaking about this bill, repealing uh, the Colorado pre uh, preemption on local control of gun violence, this is exactly why I stood behind it and was happy to advance it in the House. Thank you, Rakuten. Um, thanks for that nice introduction, Edie. And um, we did really work together as a team in the state legislature this year to, to pass some gun safety um, regulations. And I think what I heard tonight, this idea of creating some model legislation so that cities can easily uh, decide, okay, we like this, we like that, we don't like this, we don't like that. And um, enact what it makes sense for them or nothing if that's what they choose. And I think that is in the spirit of the law. And so I think you all are really doing the right thing here by laying that out so that cities making it easier for cities to decide what they wanna do. Um, I do think it would be very powerful if a lot of the cities in Boulder County decided they wanted to pass a similar set of rules and that would make all of those regulations stronger because people would have to travel further to thwart those laws or you know, to, to purchase guns. And I think, of course, I believe that if we have less guns, we'll have less gun violence. Um, I come at this also from the perspective of, uh, yes, mass shootings are horrible, but we have a much bigger problem and that is gun suicide and what we really horribly call everyday gun violence. So every day people are dying on our streets. They're dying in, in their homes from gun violence. And so I'm very interested in us addressing all the different things that go along with that I have been reading the chat and I know there's a lot of people on there that are feeling unheard and um, who are gun proponents. And um, I think that's an, a voice that we have to listen to. And one of the things that a lot of them are talking about is mental health. And of course, I am a strong proponent of improving our mental health care delivery, the services that we offer and so I agree, we really do have to look at mental health in our community. And that is really an important part of this conversation. Currently, you can go purchase a gun that can fire however many rounds is legal here in Colorado. 
And it takes you about maybe 20 minutes on average to complete that purchase. If instead you wanted to go and see a psychiatrist, that would take you at least 60 days, if not more. And that is if you could even find a psychiatrist that would take you. And if you have insurance and a, a way of paying for it. So I think we have to change that equation. We have to have more mental health resources. And um, so I'm very interested in working on that as well. And that's been a huge focus for me at the legislature and, and also locally. I think uh, we're looking at trying to improve mental health resources here in Boulder County. And I think that should be part of this conversation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you both. I appreciate that. We've got one other question um, just to allow you two to give some of your input and expertise and curious, are there implementation and, and of course speak into Senate Bill 256, but are there Im implementation approaches or maybe preferences that you're hearing about from your Boulder County constituents that would fall in line with this conversation? And that's for both Rep Amavali and, and Rep Putin. I don't know if you wanna go in the same order or, or swap it up a little. I'm sorry, Marta, would you repeat the question? Oh yeah, of course. Just curious about if there are implementation approaches, right? The bill gets made, but then there's the implementation that typically happens on a local level. So are there implementation approaches or preferences that you're hearing specifically from your Boulder County constituents? Well, I would, I would just say that um, the Boulder City Council and the Boulder County Commissioners uh, now have um, the ability to open up discussions uh, about possible ordinances or regulations and our city and in our county. And I think that's where this begins because we have restored uh, that authority to them. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think every locality is going to implement this law in the way that makes sense for them. And um, so I think for some, some places, they will want to ask people to vote on that. And in other places, the local government will want to decide what they, what they believe to be the, the voice of the people. And I know that Boulder has a really, um, the city of Boulder has a very robust process for listening to citizens before they enact any legislation. And I think that's good and right. And I hope other, that every locality that wants to implement these laws will have a robust process for taking citizen input because I think that does make for better regulations. Great. Appreciate both of you joining in on the conversation and you're welcome to stay and listen and to the dialogue. And again, just to hear what some of the conversations are one, but also to look at some ways that you might be able to support that work as you move, uh, move along in, in your public service as well. So I want to open up to our electeds to ask some questions. We have uh, presenters were kind enough to stay on and be here to be present with every town and um, with Giffords Legal Center, and of course, some of our own local electeds, uh, Rachel Friend and Tim Howard, who brought on the collaborative action. So I want to open it up to questions, and I am, you know, just moderating that, and we'll do my best to watch hands that might jump up or, or other hands that might pop up on the screen so that we can um, talk about this conversation, and we will start closing up uh, to get to an adjournment at 825. So we still have a little bit of time for conversation. Kyle Brown, thanks for raising your hand virtually. Jump on in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. And uh, Rep. Mobley for their leadership on this on this issue. It's really wonderful to have such great uh, representation here in, in Boulder County. 
I wanted to ask uh, maybe the commissioner or uh, trustee Howard or um, council member friend, uh, if they could speak a little bit to, to the next steps that we as a consortium might be taking um, on this issue. So um, I'll, I'll step in and, and offer some initial thoughts and then um, Rachel, if you can chime in and, and Marta as well. Um, back, um, back after the King Super shooting and after the initial um, outreach um, to Boulder City Council, um, our Superior Board of Trustees, we had a working session where we discussed what, what could we possibly do locally that could have an impact um, and the recognition at the time that the state preemption was there, what we realized is it was premature um, to do that. But my perspective on this is the next step is as we start to get the model, the draft model legislation, we make that available to folks and then they bring it to their local town boards, have discussions about it. And then as Representative Amabile and Representative Putin so rightly said, then set up the plan for um, getting resident input and, and having a dialogue about this and understanding where is your town or your city or your county on this and where, where do you wanna go? Um, do, do you wanna adopt anything, you know, and as, Representative Amabile said, or nothing, or some combination of things that can um, have an impact. So to me, the, the start is around getting that model legislation, which we're working with Giffords in every town to get some drafts of that in the weeks ahead, and then make that available. It's, it's really a resource. Um, and then start the dialogue among the council members and then set up the plan that the process. Rachel? You muted yourself there, Tim, at the end. I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree with all that. Um, I think sort of as, as every town in Giffords are coming up with the model legislation, there ideally would be a core group of us from, from this subset of, of local representatives who are um, collaborating and kind of coordinating on um, how to do outreach and next steps because we are pretty early in this process um, outside of, of the work that Giffords is doing. So I think a, a concrete next step would be um, having people who are interested in um, sort of being involved in this and maybe ambassadors for reaching out um, to their councils let Marta know and then um, Tim and I can get your emails and uh, we can sort of form a, a broader working group from within this group. You're on mute, Marta. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't find my button here, but as I'm flipping through screens, thanks. Um, Commissioner Levy, did you want to respond to that or did you have a, a separate question? Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm unmuted yet. Here. There you are. Oh, okay. All right. Well, no, I. I actually had lowered my hand, but um, since you called on me, uh, I had a different question actually. Uh, yeah. And, and but I lowered my hand because I think I figured out the answer to it. So some the earlier presenters talked about some other things uh, such as the, a minimum age of purchase and licensing um, gun dealers, uh, and I'm not familiar with what the licensing requirements are, but I was kind of curious from um, Rep. Hooten whether th that kind of provision would be included in the allowance of local control. I, I'm pretty sure it was, but so much of the discussion was around um, banning assault weapons that I think a lot of the, you know, the maybe the more impactful um, powerful aspects of the bill may have been overlooked. Uh, so I, I just think some of these ideas that we heard earlier on are really important to keep in mind. 
Um, and, and then the other aspect of the bill that I was especially interested in that, uh, um, you know, really doesn't require collective action is where is um, determining where people are allowed to um, carry a, a weapon. And um, that also was preempted and your bill restored uh, that right to um, prohibit guns from parks where children are playing or from grocery stores or places like that. So I just, I mean, I think the first thing was a question as to how broad that allowance for local control is. And then the other was just an observation. Right, so uh, I will address um... The, your okay your second question which is the authority that a local that a local jurisdiction would have on controlling where firearms can be carried and um, on public spaces they do have that jurisdiction and uh, businesses have the authority to restrict um, concealed carry in their, on their private property. Uh, the bill also includes the uh, higher, higher ed institutions like the Col University of Colorado. So they are now, their authority has been restored to determine where on campus a uh, concealed weapon can be carried and where it cannot. Um, these, the bill once again um, gives local jurisdictions the authority to make determinations about where firearms can be carried, what firearms can be sold in their communities. And uh, it's really that simple. Um, the state of Colorado allows for concealed carry. So if you are traveling through a community that has ordinances around concealed carry, um, but you're just traveling through, you're stopping, uh, you're not living here, you're not violating, you don't know specifically in clear terms what our local ordinances are, then you are acting in good faith. You're not violating anything. Um, there is no ordinance or regulation that any community in Colorado is going to consider around the possession or sale of firearms that is not going to involve uh, a very robust community conversation where everyone has an opportunity to weigh in. And that includes everyone on this chat uh, who lives in any community that are considering uh, ordinances or regulations around firearms, carry, uh, purchase, use. And Claire, help me if I didn't address your question more fully. Was that it? We didn't hear you, Claire. No, I said it's fine. There are a lot of other people that have their hands up. Okay. Um, Joan had a hand up, so I wanted to, excuse me, Council Member Peck, do you still have a question? No, Marta, thanks for asking. I was just going to talk about some of the things that I want to happen in Longmont, see if anyone else was on this track but I realize this is a Q&A for uh, the panelists. So I don't think this is the proper uh, format. So thank you. Okay. Um, Council member Christensen. I can't hear you yet. Sorry, couldn't find my button. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted to thank uh, our elected officials for their work on this. I know it's very, very difficult and, and it's a serious national problem and state problem and local problem. And 
the only way to actually do this is slowly and carefully as you have done. And um, I do know exactly how difficult it is because every time we try to um, discuss anything even slightly about guns of any sort in the city of Longmont, we are greeted by the same sort of comments um, that you see in the chat. And it, the there isn't a, a possibility of conversation because it's just about snide comments and insults and threats. And, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so I, I congratulate you for trying to do this on a statewide basis and uh, making some headway. And I do think that we can um, perhaps craft something, but we, we do have to uh, get the cooperation of each other, not just within the cities, but also not just Boulder County, but the adjacent counties, because, you know, as just for instance, um, a guy went up to, and th this is an outlier. Most people who have guns are really good people and they're responsible. But this guy went up to uh, Loveland to try to buy a gun. Uh, the guy ran a background, the clerk ran a background check on him and said, no, you've got a, an assault record and I'm not going to sell you the gun. And then he said, well, sell it to my girlfriend. And the guy said, no, that's illegal too. And then he went up to Fort Collins and the clerk sold him a gun. Then he came down to Longmont and uh, started waving his gun around in the play area in front of the theater. And someone called the police, the police came, he wouldn't surrender his gun and the police shot him. But so this is an example, I'm just saying, this is like, Weld County is six miles away. Whatever we do, um, it really needs to be something that the adjacent counties can collaborate with and, and join in because um, we can do whatever we want, but it really doesn't. It's not that effective, you know, unless we can get everybody piece by piece. But this is the way to begin: is to uh, collaborate with each other and and listen to everybody, even when they're being rude, and um, try to have a community discussion about what the community actually needs. So I I really appreciate all your hard work. I think this uh, the red flag law was particularly important because, as we know. Um, Suicide is the greatest uh, cause of gun violence, 80%. So it's not people like this crazy guy I was talking about who commit uh, gun violence. It is actually people turning it upon themselves. And uh, so it has to go hand in hand with mental health care. And um, as somebody said, that's really, as Steve Fenberg said today when he was in an interview, we do, the state is addressing mental health care, but that's not part of the gun laws. It's it's a separate issue. So thank you again for doing this. And if you have any suggestions, and um, I know that Tim and Rachel will be working on uh, building a, a model for something we can do that will be efficient and useful and, and get community uh, acceptance. So thank you very much. Great. I'm gonna move to council member friend. I believe you were next. Well, I, I was, um, thanks Marta. I was gonna follow up with um, Joan Peck's uh, statement that she thought maybe this was the, the wrong time for the conversation. And I'm, I'm really curious what she's thinking about for long that. So I wanted to say, at least from my perspective, I'd, I'd love to, um, hear what, what she's thinking and um, have that dialogue. And then also wanted to respond to um, Polly's comments um, about, you know, essentially this is, th these are really hard conversations to have. They are very emotional and um, loaded and, it, you know, it's, it's not easy to, um, to take up gun violence prevention laws. So I, 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 I guess I just want to be pretty direct about that, having um, worked a lot as a gun violence prevention activist on, on state laws. I'm sure that um, our state representatives can, can speak to kind of standing in that fire as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it is about trying to protect our communities, which I think is our 
our number one job as elected representatives. And so um, I think it's it's important that we that we do try and be brave. I, I think um, also Polly was getting at like it's it's better if this is done more broadly, like ideally this, you know, the the strong laws that we seek would be done at the national or the state level. Um, but what we're left with is is picking this up from from our positions and kind of trying to lift it up. So um, I, I guess I'm just inviting inviting us all to kind of lean in and, and be brave where it's needed. Thanks for that. Councilmember Peck. Yes, I am going to speak. Thank you. Um, I saw in the uh, in the chat that they said that I was afraid to speak up. I, I am not. So <laughs> what we talked about a couple of years ago and uh, Lance, Tuve, I think his name is Tuve or Tuve, I don't know how to pronounce it, in the chat was correct in that we did have a uh, conversation from about with the public about gun safety and firearms, et cetera, et cetera. And what was mentioned was mental health constantly. So uh, about a month ago, I made a motion that we put on the agenda to put half of our um, marijuana tax into mental health and addiction. So that will be coming up on our calendar probably in the next couple of meetings. So I agree that this is a mental health problem first and foremost, the far right, the far left, everybody in between have mentioned that it is a mental health issue. And I agree that that's where we need to start first. Um, and all the people in the chat, if you really believe that you should be able to own a gun, help us solve this problem. Help us solve the people that are making your rights so, uh, so bad to the public. Help us solve the bad players uh, and, for me, mental health is where you start. And that is what Longmont's going to be addressing. So uh, I just want you to know that we are on this. We get it. Thank you. Thank oh, you. can I say one more thing? Yep. Um, can the host, and I assume that you, Marta, would you, would you say that my understanding of this meeting was not that it was going to be proactive or interactive? It was just inviting people to hear about the laws that were passed, not to, we didn't, you didn't invite pro or anti-gun people. It looks like it was just people who, to explain the laws. So um, I think that's an important thing to mention to all of the anti-people who are angry that they're not being allowed to talk. Sure. Yeah. And I'm not reading through the chat because I'm trying to manage this other side, but I can reiterate what I did um, say at the beginning of the meeting. Again, this is a consortium of cities uh, meeting that we meet every other month to talk about issues that are affecting our community priorities and have done some really amazing collaborative work. And you're right. And this is another conversation with uh, elected officials around Boulder County to address some legislation from this session, the same way that we will be talking about the American Rescue Plan uh, Act and those funds, the same way that we'll be talking about transportation bills that have passed, the same way that we're um, our meeting in regards to our sale, uh, road tax, et cetera. So um, hopefully that's helpful just to clarify any questions that folks might have about one, what the meeting is. And I heard, I, I believe in some of the response from presenters that is really important is, okay, with any bill that gets passed, then we have an opportunity locally to implement, to make a choice. How are we gonna implement it? How might, wherever that lands. And so that's the conversation that folks said, yeah, let's let's have a, have a, a discussion together about that. And um, we can put our heads together and put our work together. But what somebody's already said and is really important to reiterate, I believe as well is, this is not the public process. This is a conversation just to learn a little bit more. Okay, what exactly does 256 do? What would that look like? How could we come together and have these conversations? Who could I connect with? And then each one of our towns and municipalities, hopefully around the state of Colorado, and wow, would that be national conversations 
to then talk about how do we work with everybody in our community to make sure that folks understand what a bill like 256 can do um, and if it's appropriate and what it looks like to use that type of legislation. And it's the same for every single bill that was passed this session by our hardworking legislators. Um, so hopefully that clarifies a little bit. And I saw a hand um, come up from our trustee, Tim Howard. Well, yes, I just wanted to um, make a comment um, to Councilwoman Christensen um, on, on your comments. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there, the real opportunity here is for us to find not just what works for our individual local communities, but for us to collaborate, to share that, to take lessons learned. And it, and it may be, hey, model legislation X, Y, Z, here's the problem with that. And we, we shouldn't be moving forward with that. It's, it's collaborating and then reaching beyond the borders of Boulder County and, and Broomfield um, City and County, because what we wanna do is we wanna make all the communities safer. And the more commonality we have and the more collaboration we have, the greater the opportunity for that. So I, I, I wanna thank everyone um, in, this, in this group um, for kind of taking the time um, to listen what's being presented. Um, because I, I do think we all share a, a common goal of reducing gun violence in whatever way we can. And again, as has been stated so effectively, it's not just mass shootings. There, there are so many aspects to this and we should be looking at a set of ordinances that have impact across all the different areas of gun violence. And again, suicide has to be at the top of the list when we're talking about that. So thank you again for the opportunity tonight. And um, Marta, if it's all right, can could we potentially ask our um, the folks from Giffords and every town if they kind of have some kind of closing thoughts as some of the local communities kind of embark on you know, investigating and researching this? That's perfect timing. Thanks, Tim. That's exactly where I was thinking. So you just saved me a, a, a chat question to you. For our every town and, and Giffords, if you'd like to closing remarks based on some of the things that you've heard or anything you'd like to add now that um, we've started the conversation. Sure, um, I can go ahead. I, I would just say that having worked with numerous communities over the years on um, all range of gun violence prevention ordinances at the local level, I think you know what I'm hearing is exactly right that these approaches do need to be tailored to the communities and um, community buy-in is of course um, very important. I do think it's also worth remembering that um, this issue is often presented as very polarizing, um, where you have a lot of people on, you know, both sides of this issue, but that's not actually very accurate. Um, you know, over 97% of Americans, um, including gun owners, support universal background checks, yet um, I know that when I testify in state legislatures on background check bills, you know, I hear um, a lot of very angry voices opposing background checks. And I think um, sometimes there's a misconception that there are equal, num you know, equal uh, people on both sides of the issue. But I don't think that's true. I think most Americans and probably most of your constituents are in favor of reasonable, evidence-based, effective gun regulations. And um, as long as you move forward with the data and um, deliberate in a public manner, then um, you know I think you're well positioned to um, enact these ordinances. Yeah, and I'll just um, echo everything Allison said. I mean, I think all of that is right. Um, I think the great thing about um, Senate Bill 256 is it allows local communities to do what's best for their communities. Um, and all of these policies that we talked about tonight um, can help save lives. They're evidence-backed. Um, 
you know, and they are effective and will be made more effective by uh, the collaborative efforts of, of all the folks on these calls. So, um, you know, I know uh, every town, I know Giffords are here to, you know, support your efforts and, and lend our expertise. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely look forward to working with everybody. So thank you again for having us. Great, thank you. I'm going to give another um, a bit here if there's any other questions from folks. Don't want to get one last question in as we've got some of our subject matter experts here with us. And if not, as we always try in our consortium meetings, if we can gift everybody a little bit of time so you can go actually eat dinner or uh, take a walk or have some family time, whatever it might be, we will welcome that. I just want to thank again uh, staff. Uh, as elected, we we are required and we sign on to to serve at any hour and uh, of the day. And our staff um, isn't. That's not part of their role. And and so we're appreciative and just want to say again thanks to, to the staff um, that is here supporting. And a special shout out to Mark Resin, who is the the lead from our policy analyst team uh, to to make these meetings happen for us uh, every other month. And some of the questions that were around next steps is really to just think about and talk with your councils and, and your own towns and jurisdictions to figure out you know, what that might look like. And you're welcome to reach out uh, to us at Boulder County, uh, commissioners at bouldercounty.org and or to council members friend or um, trustee Howard to uh, get involved in the collaborative action that they put out there as an invitation. And we will wrap up and for our consortium members are and public as always are always welcome our next meeting will be on august 4th and we are looking forward to continuing just the collaborative work the discussions sharing of resources and and sharing of ideas that's how we make stronger communities that's how we come out in crises more effectively more efficiently and with more folks um, moving forward in a resilient manner so appreciate all of you and i hope you all have a great night Thanks again, Steph. Hi, everybody.